Okay, folks, so it's, it's 11 o'clock, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so thanks for coming to the talk. Um, I'm Matei Zaharia, and uh, I'll be talking about Spark. Uh, just a bit of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, background on me, if, if you don't know me. So I'm, um, I'm currently a, a, a PhD student at UC Berkeley. I've been doing research on big data systems for the past uh, six years. Uh, before working on Spark, I actually worked extensively on Hadoop. I'm a Hadoop committer, and I worked on the job scheduling features in Hadoop. And then, uh, you know, a few years ago, I started the Spark project. And uh, after uh, finishing at Berkeley, I'm going to be continuing uh, to do research uh, as an assistant professor at MIT. And so I'm, I'm excited actually to have uh, eventually two universities involved in this project and, you know, uh, more people from the East Coast as well. So let me just talk very briefly about what Spark is. Uh, how many people have actually seen it before or used it before? Yeah, okay, so a decent number of people. Yeah, so, so Spark is a, a fast and expressive cluster computing framework that's designed to be a generalization of, of MapReduce, but it's also designed to be highly compatible with Apache Hadoop. And it tries to improve two things, um, efficiency and usability. So to, to improve efficiency, it, it offers uh, in-memory computing capabilities, which can make it a lot faster for applications that need to you know, reuse data or share data across uh, computations. And it also offers more general computation graphs and operators, which lets you express complicated applications more efficiently. Uh, to improve usability, it has these rich language integrated APIs in Java, Scala, and Python. So in Scala, it looks like you're working with Scala collections. And it also has an interactive shell. You can use it from, uh, you know, within the Scala shell. So what, what exactly you know, difference does this make? So in terms of the, the efficiency, we've seen on real applications as much as 100x faster. And you know, another interesting thing, this 100x is within memory data, but even with on-disk data, we can go two to 10 times faster than just MapReduce because we have the more general engine. Um, in terms of the usability, you can often have a you know, factor of five less code, especially if you're using Scala, which you know, hopefully people here are. Um, a bit about the, the history of the project. So it started as a research project in 2009, and we open sourced it in 2010. But since that point, and especially in the past couple of years, you know, it's, it's actually grown uh, significantly as just an open source project. And we at Berkeley are running the project uh, you know, from, from this open source point of view. You know, we're still doing research on specific aspects, but we have a big team dedicated to just making it you know, better, uh, more, uh, you know, more stable, easier to use and so on. So today, the, the open source community includes 17 different companies that are contributing code to the project. This is in the past year. And we've, we have major um, uh, users, uh, including Yahoo, Intel, Adobe, and uh, you know, multiple uh, startups in the Bay Area. Um, and so, so these, these guys are contributing quite a bit. And to, to further uh, sort of help grow the, the open source community, we've also um, entered the Apache incubator uh, a month ago. Um, and apart from you know, just, just being the, the core engine and the open source project, Spark is also increasingly an expanding stack of, of higher level programming frameworks on top of it. So that's actually one of the things I'll talk about today as one of our long term directions for the project. So on top of the core engine, we've implemented uh, SQL. Uh, this is the Shark project, which takes Apache Hive and, and makes it run on Spark. We've implemented stream processing and Spark streaming. These are both released today, and two things that are coming uh, later this summer or this fall are graphics, which is a framework for graph processing, and ML base for machine learning. And one of the cool things with implementing these on top of Spark is you know, not, not only are they fast, but also you can combine these things in the same application. So they all have these nice functional Scala APIs, and you can do, like, say, SQL query and then do a graph computation on the result uh, and stuff like that, or do it all interactively from the Scala shell. So this is part of a bigger you know, stack of projects at Berkeley that's called the Berkeley Data Analytics Stack, or BADASS. Um, that's, you know, I didn't come up with that, but, but that's what it's called. 
Um, Okay, so what will I do in the stack? So the stack has a, a part at the, a small part at the beginning is just kind of giving background on the project for people who haven't seen it. But you know, since a bunch of people have, um, I also wanted to focus on some other things. So after the, the background on Spark itself, I'm going to talk about two of the projects we're building on top, and especially the way they integrate with Scala and with with the rest of the API. Uh, these are Graphics and Shark, um, and then I'm going to talk a, a bit about the open source community. This is you know, one of the things that's really grown in the past year, and there's some cool stuff going on. And finally, I'll talk about like what what we think is the, the most exciting part of the project, which is the power to actually compose these different programming models and and uh, sort of uh, analytics tasks within the same engine. And I'll I'll talk about you know interesting things we've seen in the engine using that. Uh, and definitely feel free to ask questions throughout. So let me just start with, uh, with sort of the, the introduction. Um, so basically, why, why did we want to make a new programming model uh, instead of just, say, taking MapReduce and adding a Scala API? Um, essentially, what we found working early on with, with MapReduce users is that you know, it, it really it made analytics a lot simpler. But as soon as you uh, got started with MapReduce and, and put a bunch of data into it, there were a bunch of applications you wanted to do that it wasn't good for. And these were first more complex applications than just one pass of MapReduce. So a lot of, say, machine learning or graph algorithms have to do multiple passes or multiple operations over the data. Um, a second thing is more interactive queries. So you've loaded you know, 10, 20 terabytes of data into a cluster. You can compute a report on them in, in say, two hours every night. But now if you have a new question, can you answer that question in, in two seconds? Or do you have to wait two hours to, to, to crunch through the whole thing? Um, and then the final thing people wanted to do is, is more real-time processing. So you know, you're building your report every night. That's, that's awesome. It's crunching a lot of data. Now can you update the same report in real time? So something we, we observed is that even though these applications look fairly different, they, they actually all need one common thing from the engine, which is more efficient support for data sharing across parallel computations. So these are all applications where you need to share data across, say, time steps or iterations. And in MapReduce, you don't have that. All you have is like one pass of computation and then write your stuff to HDFS. So when you try to do these applications with MapReduce, you get stuff that looks like this. So you know, just as an example, if you have an iterative algorithm like PageRank, you would maybe start with the data in, in your HDFS and then do one step of MapReduce um, up here. Uh, sorry, I guess you can't see this. Yeah, up here, um, uh, which is this blue box, um, and do one pass of your computation. And then to share the data with the next step, you have to write it all back out to HDFS again. And then on the next iteration of, of your page rank, you load it back in and, and you continue doing that. Um, or if you want to do ad hoc queries, often these queries are you now in on the same subset of data. But if that data set is in HDFS, you know you have to incur the cost of reading it from disk every time. And uh, this is uh, using using HDFS for this is slow due to data replication. Each time you write, it has to go across the network uh, due to object serialization and disk I/O. Um, and actually, when, when we looked at sort of real Hadoop applications, often you find for these kinds of applications that they're spending like 90% of their time doing this stuff as opposed to actually running the user's code. So in Spark, you can do this sharing in memory between different steps, and you can both create longer chains than just one map reduce, uh, or just ask multiple queries on the same in-memory data set. So you can just load the data once and, and share it very efficiently. And this can easily be 10 to 100 times faster than the network or the disk. So the way you do this stuff in Spark is that instead of just thinking in terms of map and reduce functions, you think in terms of distributed data sets. So you get this abstraction called resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. And these are just parallel collections of you know, Scala objects, if you're using Scala or Python objects or Java ones, uh, that are split up across the cluster. And you can control for each data set whether you want to keep it in memory or on disk. Um, the, you manipulate these data sets to different parallel operators. We have a whole big array of operators. I'll, I'll talk about it a bit. And they're also resilient in that they, they can automatically be recovered on failure. So you don't have to worry about uh, nodes crashing in the middle of your computation. 
And to, do, uh, to, to program these, you use this functional interface in Scala, Java, or Python. So this is kind of what uh, Spark code looks like um, out here. Uh, in this example, this will be code you can type into the Scala shell um, where you, uh, you have, say, a bunch of error messages in, in a log file across the cluster, and you want to load them into memory and ask some queries. So we're going to have a cluster here. We have a master node and a bunch of workers, um, and we can type in code like this. Um, so, for example, we can say, okay, let's have a, 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 a file, a text file in HDFS, which is our first uh, data set, and, and we can represent this as a collection of lines. So you just give Spark an HDFS path, and it knows how to load that. Um, and then this is our base data set. And on that, we just do transformations using Scala uh, functions. So, uh, for example, you can filter and just pass it a closure, like uh, to, to, to select out strings that start with error. And you get back a transform data set, which is just the stuff that passes the filter. Um, so what the, the thing we do under the cover here is we can actually take the Scala closure object. This isn't a DSL or something like that for strings. It's actually just a Scala function you passed in. And we serialize that function and all the variables it depends on, and we send that to the cluster. So it's much like working with collections um, locally. Um, and then you can do other transformations. Uh, maybe, for example, you had these, uh, these uh, error messages and the tab-separated fields, and the actual message is field number two. So you, you can pull that out with a map. Um, and then you can also choose which data sets is in, uh, are in memory. So you can say, okay, cache only the error messages in memory. So what happens is, um, as you write these transformations, Spark sort of remembers the graph of them, and it actually will evaluate them lazily. So at this point, it hasn't actually run anything yet. Um, and then when you run um, another type of operation um, called an action, it will actually uh, launch a job to compute these. So here we're going to say, OK, let's, let's count how many of the error messages contain foo. And count is called an action. Count has to give back a number to the program. It can't sort of defer the computation any further. So when we get this, we come up with a plan to actually execute the whole thing. And so what will happen here is that Spark looks at where the data is on, on disk on each node. Um, it sends tasks to process the data locally. Um, you know, these guys do, do their work. They send back results. Um, and the nodes also build a cache of, um, of just the error messages they read along the way. So that's, you know, first time you run this, this is what happens. And second time you run it, um, you, Spark will know that, that the data is in the cache, and it will hit the cache and, and give you back the result um, quite a bit faster. So, so this is kind of how it works. You can type this stuff from the Scala shell as well from um, uh, standalone programs. Um, just to give you a, a sense of what you can do with this, so one of the, the demos I do is f uh, just uh, loading Wikipedia, which is about 60 gigabytes on a, on a 20 node cluster, and just doing full text search of it. Just kind of stupidly you know, find articles that contain a particular string. And if you do this with on disk data with Hadoop or, 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 um, uh, or Spark on disk, it takes about 20 seconds to scan the whole thing from disk. If you do it within memory data, it takes about half a second. So you can really get interactive um, response time on, on, on fairly large data sets um, uh, with just arbitrary Scala queries. Um, and uh, you know, this also scales up nicely. So uh, we, we can also do, um, for example, we tried a terabyte of text data on a 100 node cluster, and you can scan that in about five seconds. So that's, that's kind of how you program it. Um, now, the other aspect of the model that's cool is the way it, um, it uh, does fault tolerance. So when you run Spark, you're going to, to use different operators, and you're going to build this graph of data sets and dependencies between them. Um, this example at the top is you know, a slightly, oh, actually, I guess this is a Python one, because I stole it from a Python talk. But hopefully, people will understand. But this is a slightly um, you know, more complicated job where we, we get a bunch of records, um, and then we, um, uh, we want to count how many records have each type. So we map each one to the rec record that type comma 1. And then we use reduce by key, which is our distributed reduce, to add up all the ones for each key. And now we get a data set of you know, key value pairs for, for each record type, uh, the number of such records. Um, and then at the end of this, we're going to do a filter. Let's say we want to pick out only uh, records that appeared at least uh, 10 times. 
So when, when you do this, so Spark will build up this dependency graph. It can go to sort of any number of levels. Um, and this is what it uses for fault recovery as well. So if it ever loses some nodes in the cluster and some of your memory, and a piece of this graph goes missing, Spark will go back and recompute stuff according to, uh, to, to the parent transformations. So, and and it, it will do this for sort of arbitrary graphs. So this is, this is you know, one of the reasons that it's, uh, it's fast is the, the data that we write in memory, we don't have to replicate it and you don't have to keep two copies of it because we know how to recover it this way. Okay. Um, just to show you one, one final example of the core Spark, I'll, I'll show you uh, one of these uh, iterative algorithms as well. This is a simple kind of machine learning um, algorithm called logistic regression. So the, the goal on this one is, this is something you use, for example, for um, classifying spam. Um, you, you have a bunch of labeled data points, like maybe you have spam and non-spam emails. You represent them as vectors, and you want to find a line that separates them. Um, and that, that you can then use when a new email comes in to decide is it spam or non-spam. So the way a lot of these algorithms work is, is gradient descent. Um, essentially, you start with a random line and then you run these small steps, these, these parallel functions that will improve the separation between the two, uh, the, the two sets. So what happens, um, yeah, what happens on each step is you run this, uh, this gradient function, which is just a sum over all the points. That you do some math that tells you essentially how well the line is, you know, is, is classifying those points. And when you do that, that gives you a direction to move the line and to improve the separation. And then you launch the same parallel sum again. It gives you another direction. You, know, you move the line a little bit. And um, as, as you keep repeating this process, eventually your line converges to a good um, separation. So this is exactly an example, uh, you know, the, kind, uh, the kind of example I was talking about earlier, where your algorithm has to do multiple you know, parallel sums. These are like multiple map reduce jobs, and they're over the same data. So if you could keep the data in memory, you could, you could make this go quite a bit faster. Um, and so this is, this is how you'd write this, this algorithm in Spark. Um, it's again, uh, this is like actual Scala code you could type in. And it's, it's, a, it's a fairly simple uh, piece of code. Um, so essentially there are two pieces here. First at the top, um, we start with say a text file and we parse it into points. Maybe you write like a, a read point function and we cache those points in memory. Um, and then at the bottom, we have some iterations. And on each iteration, we do a map over the points to compute that, that gradient function. And we sum up the values with a reduce. Uh, one of the cool things, you know, if you're using Scala is you can replace that line at the top instead of being a distributed data set. It could just be an array or a list in your main program. And the bottom part of it would still work, you know. So it's, it's really like, like working with your current collections. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of how it works. Um, and then this one, if you look at the performance, you get you know, very similar kind of speed ups to what I showed uh, before. So if you write this kind of application in, um, in, in say, Hadoop MapReduce, you, know, you, you get something that will run in parallel, but it takes the same time for each iteration. Here's, it's about two minutes because it's reading um, the, the data from disk. Um, if you write this in Spark, you get uh, first iteration happens in about 80 seconds. This is just loading the data into memory once, and then further iterations are about one second. And uh, one of the you know, really interesting things about this is when you write the Hadoop version, basically it will scale linearly, it will behave really well. It's, it's a nicely uh, you know, behaved map reduce job. It basically is just mapping some stuff. But because of the, the nature of the algorithm, um, the, the actual math you're doing for, for each point is so cheap that, that you're spending you know, more, more than 90% of your time just dealing with the I.O. system in Hadoop. So this is the kind of thing where, you know, if you, you, unless you actually look at profile your job and see where it's spending time, you could be running very inefficiently um, uh, due, due to the Hadoop engine. Okay. So that's, you know, that's kind of a, a quick tour of, of what Spark does. Um, apart from these map and reduce type things that I showed and filter, there are quite a few other operators as well. We actually, we, we've tried to, to do, you know, similarly to, to projects like PIG, we've tried to provide a lot of the high level operators you might want just as Scala functions. And we're adding more and more of these over time. So we want to make it very easy to work with data. You don't have to write your own, 
you know, SQL joins or group buys or things like that. Um, and the, the engine itself um, supports any combination of these operators into a graph. Um, you, you don't have to do just map and reduce. Um, and it has a few other uh, things that, that make it um, faster as well. It has, uh, for example, support for hash-based reduce instead of the sort-based one that Hadoop does, which is faster if you're just doing grouping and joining. Um, and it also has support for controlling the partitioning of data across the nodes, which matters. It can, it can help reduce the communication in, in a lot of these algorithms if you group, like, say, you know, web pages from the same domain on the same machine or, or stuff like that. Um, so that, that's the, the graph here is showing um, if you implement page rank, you know, you can get um, sort of a 3x speed up just by doing it in memory, but then you can get an additional sort of 3x speed up by also controlling the partitioning of your data. Okay, so that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a quick tour of Spark. Um, now, the, the, I think the, the, the rest of the talk, what I want to um, cover is what, um, what we're building on top and, and sort of where we see this going next. So definitely, so th this is going to be uh, newer stuff, but definitely let me know if, you know, if it, at, at any point you have questions about this or about the previous stuff. So I'm going to start with graphics, which is a project that, um, you know, we've started uh, building for graph computation. So let's just do a bit of background on that. So graphs, I, I think everyone here knows, are, are very important um, in data mining. Uh, just some examples of, of things you might do with graphs are, um, if you have a social network, for example, you might use them to identify the influential people on it and then you know, suggest them to others as people to follow or things like that. Um, you can use them to find communities, find groups of your users uh, that you know, have some, some common property or that maybe you need to put in touch with each other. You can use them to target ads. When a new user joins uh, your site, maybe you don't know anything about that user, but as soon as they start adding a few friends, you can start inferring stuff about them and actually start uh, giving them um, more, more uh, meaningful um, uh, recommendations and ads. Um, and you can also just use them to model complex dependencies if you're doing some kind of scientific or you know, just a, a even machine learning kind of workload. So because of this, um, widespread uh, use of graphs, there's been a lot of graph processing systems proposed in the past few years that try to do this on clusters and try to, to scale linearly uh, and, and things like that. Um, so just some examples, uh, uh, Google Spiegel was, you know, one of the first ones people sort of talked about Google, uh, wrote a research paper about it and said, hey, this is how we're doing graphs. Uh, Giraffe is an open source implementation of Spiegel from Apache. Um, GraphLab is an academic and, and now also commercial project from uh, University of Washington and CMU, uh, which is a fast, uh, basically, uh, a graph processing engine for machine learning, um, and Twitter also has something called, uh, I believe, Cassavery. I think that's, that's what this uh, is a picture of, but we couldn't find any logo for it, so we just put that on there. So, so this, you know, people have been building a bunch of these. And what these engines process, uh, provide are sort of two things. Um, w one is an API to, to actually capture the dependencies between the computation. So instead of thinking in terms of map functions and reduce functions, in these systems you usually think in terms of being a vertex and saying, hey, you know, I'd like on each step of the computation to see um, information from all of my neighbors. And like somehow the system is going to give you that at runtime and find a good schedule to execute all these vertices and, and actually do, uh, do them in parallel. So that's one of the things they give you. And the second thing they give you is they try to exploit the structure of the graph to reduce the amount of computation and communication. So examples of that are they might partition the graph so that you know, vertices that have lots of edges w w uh, within, between each other are on the same machine. So you don't have to send that stuff across the network. Or they might say that, hey, uh, each vertex is actually trying to do a, an associative operation, like a sum of the stuff around them, and um, they're going to, to do that locally on each machine and then just sum up the results, kind of like a, a combiner in MapReduce. So th these different systems, Spiegel and GraphLab and so on, basically have different APIs for doing this. So given this stuff, uh, the question, I guess, is, how, how is graphics different from them? How is it different from GraphLab or Giraffe or Spiegel? 
And um, the, the real answer is, you know, we're going to do a lot of the, the same stuff underneath, but the thing we're trying to do better is uh, simplicity. So it, the, the main thing that, uh, that puts graphics apart is that instead of being a, a separate engine to do graph stuff with its own data format and its own runtime, it's actually a library within Spark. And you can use it, you can build graphs using the standard Spark operations. You can run these models like Peggle and GraphLab on them. And you can also query the results of them using the same Spark operations. So what this means is that uh, th there's no sort of special work uh, required to, to do ETL into graphics. So to extract, transform, and load the data from whatever format you have in HDFS to whatever the graph processing system um, supports. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy to basically, similarly, the, there's no need to do anything special to consume the output of it. The output of, of graphics is just an RDD. It's a collection of Scala objects, and you can run your filters and counts and things like that exactly as I showed before. Um, because it's running on Spark, it also automatically gets fault tolerance, and the fault tolerance composes across these things you do below and after it. So like if you build your graph with a map function, you know, from reading from a file, and then you do page rank on it, and something fails, Spark knows how to recover both the map function and, and the graph stuff on top. Um, and finally, you can use the Spark shell, you know, similar to the, the examples I was showing before for querying text files, to query your graphs. So once you build your, your, your you know, interesting kind of graph in memory, or maybe as you're tweaking parameters to your algorithm, you can just ask questions from the shell. And I think this is a thing that, that none of the, the other systems actually have. So uh, the, 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 the second aspect that, uh, you know, th that helps here is um, basically we, the, the, for, the, for, pro, for, pro, uh, sorry, for programmability, we also um, offer a very simple Scala uh, API with the same kind of ideas as Spark. So working with graphics is actually really similar to working with different, um, uh, with distributed collections. And on top of this API, we've also implemented the GraphLab, GraphLab and Peggle APIs, they each only about 20 lines of code, so it's very easy to, 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 uh, to do things in these models if this is how you want to think of your problem. Um, and you can also write uh, calculations directly. So PageRank, for example, you can write it in about five lines of code. So it makes it very compact. So here's um, you know, just a, a bit more detail on how graphics works. The, the thing we add to Spark in it is something called resilient distributed graphs, which is an extension of the distributed data sets I called before called RDDs. And these are, uh, a graph is basically a, an RDD of vertices and an RDD of edges. And we, we actually store them in a special way to, you know, to take advantage of the partitioning and stuff. But that's kind of how you think about it. You, you just give it a bunch of edges and a bunch of vertices, and graphics will organize them to make it possible to do graph computations. Um, and on top of this graph, you know, you can do your standard things like map and filter and so on. And you also get three extra primitives that implement kind of the low level operations in Peggle uh, and GraphLab like systems um, and that, that you can use to express graph parallel computation. And using this, you can capture, you know, many graph algorithms just directly, or if you want, you can implement, you know, Peggle and GraphLab on top and, and get that API. So let's just see some code example um, of how you work with this. Um, so here's, here's what we're going to start with. So this first part here is just Spark code. We're going to load in a graph. And uh, we have a text file in HDFS, which is maybe um, uh, web pages. Maybe these are our vertices. And then we have a second file, which is edges, like the, the links between uh, different pages. And we just load these as you know, Spark text files. And for, for the, the edges, we, we're going to do a map to turn them into an, an edge object. Uh, maybe it's like tab separated, the source and destination. So this is how you make your graph. You just run some Spark code. Uh, then you say, OK, new graph. And you pass in the vertices, which can have any data type, and the edges. And you can also ask to cache it in memory. OK. So as soon as you have that, you can just start asking some questions about the graph. Like, let's count the number of vertices in it. That's just going to count that RDD. Um, or let's count the number of edges. So you can do these kind of questions sort of interactively. Um, and you can also transform the graph. So say you want to get a subgraph. Maybe you want only the, uh, the, the uh, vertices in this thing that uh, you know, reference Berkeley somehow. 
So you can just pull out the pages that, that um, actually contain Berkeley. Maybe you know, it's, it's one of the fields in your graph. And that just gives you a new graph object. Um, and finally, you can run graph operations on them. In graphics, we're actually going to provide a standard library with a lot of the common algorithms. So you don't have to write page rank again, even though everyone says like, hey, you, know, you can write page rank in three lines of code in our system. You know, really, you want to write it in one. You want to call an optimized implementation. Um, so, so you can do that. Um, and when you run, uh, just to see what happens with the output then, so when you run page rank, you get back a new graph object which has uh, extra information on its vertex. It has the rank. Um, and you can, so, so you get this graph of ranks. And now you can do stuff like, say, sum up the, the ranks of all the vertices or you know, print out a specific one or save this thing to a text file. Um, and just to show you that, you know, if, if you like implementing PageRank, it's not too bad. Uh, this is the, the code for, for the PageRank as well. So, you know, th there's a bit of stuff going on there, but it's basically this little thing here. It's, it's using the Pregel model uh, built on top of, of graphics, and it's just giving it some functions, like basically a, a, a function to apply to each vertex and then a function to combine the values across the vertices. So this is, this is still a little bit in flux, but basically the final API will look something like this. So that's, that's kind of a quick tour of graphics. Um, so basically, to, to summarize, we have this distributed graph abstraction. On top of it, we wrote the Pregel and Graph, graph Lab APIs, or you can just use it directly. Uh, and on, on top of that, we're actually writing a lot of the, the common algorithms you might want, so you don't have to do those yourselves. Um, and we're still working actually on optimizing this. We have some, some, some pretty interesting things that we're doing, but, but the early performance of graphics is also pretty good. So just uh, this example here, I'm comparing our page rank on a 16 node cluster with, uh, with Hadoop, and we're you know, about, um, I guess, eight or nine times faster on this one already. And the reason we're faster is the combination of the features I mentioned before. So definitely in-memory caching helps. Hash-based operators help because we don't care about sorting this data. Um, and also controlling the data partitioning. So not having, you know, when you're going to join data sets a bunch of times, partitioning them so, so they can all be joined locally on each machine. And uh, this is still, you know, under construction, but we think an alpha release of this will be ready this fall. So you'll, you'll see it when it's ready. Basically, we just want to uh, make sure we optimize and, and tune the API uh, to something that we can support later on. Okay. So that's, that's one of the projects. The um, second project I want to just talk briefly about is Shark, um, as I think we're building on top. And then I'll talk about how we're actually putting these things uh, together. So. Um, Graphics is, you know, is more for programmers who want to do graph computations. Shark is uh, if you just want to quickly ask SQL queries. Um, so Shark is, is a project that's actually been out for, I think, a little bit over a year now. Um, it's a, a column-oriented uh, SQL uh, analytics engine that's built on top of Spark. And um, it's, it supports uh, SQL. It's actually basically the Shark code base is Apache Hive, which we modified to run on top of the Spark engine. So it supports the Hive dialect of SQL. It also supports complex analytics because it has a Scala API so that you can call into it from, from Scala and, and combine your SQL with, with Scala code. Um, and it tries to be highly compatible with Apache Hive. Um, and basically, it supports the existing Hive language, user-defined functions, uh, serializers and deserializers, and scripts. Um, and it can run on unmodified Hive warehouses. You can just launch it and point it to your meta store and start asking questions. Uh, so this is because we, we base the, 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 the code base on uh, the SQL part of the code base on, um, on Hive itself. Uh, and it's, been, it's actually starting to be used at a number of companies. Uh, the one that's been doing the most with it so far is Yahoo, actually, where a team has been both helping us build Shark and using it for, uh, for in-memory um, analytics on their ad data. So um, Shark's performance uh, you know, is, is similar to, to what you see in Spark. So uh, this is uh, some, um, some results on sort of real queries at uh, one, one company that is using them um, on this kind of two terabyte data warehouse. And basically, you can see we're about five to 10 times faster than Hive for on disk data. And we can be you know, 50 to 100 times faster within memory data. And this is, again, for you know, similar reasons to, to the other stuff before. So it 
performs well. Actually, we, we've also tried comparing that with things like, like Cloudera and Impala that are you know, C++ and generate a whole bunch of code in LLVM. And we actually perform very similarly to those. Um, but the, the part that is, you know, that is kind of cool if, if you're a Scala user and that I think actually really sets this apart from the, the other fast SQL things people are doing in this space is that it also integrates very nicely with Spark. So um, using Shark, you can just run you know, Hive, Hive queries through JDBC or through the shell, but you also have this API to run them from Scala. So what you can do is in a Scala program, you can write your uh, more complex analytics functions like your logistic regression or the graph stuff I showed before, the page rank. Um, and then you can do um, SQL to RDD. So here's a SQL query, run it, and give me a, a distributed data set from it. And this is you know, similar to how in JDBC you get back a bunch of records. Here you get back a bunch of rows that are distributed across the cluster. And then you can just pass that into your, uh, your machine learning functions or uh, the other functions you want. So what will happen here is that Shark will actually run in the same sort of Spark application as, as this. It will share the same caches, you know, the same in-memory uh, space, and uh, it will build this result in memory and then just feed it directly into the Scala function. So it's very cheap to move data back and forth between SQL and Scala and to write an application that combines these two things. Um, and this is, we're actually, we're actively working on making this better as well. So one of the other things that will be coming up is being able to run Scala and then save that result as a shark table and, and query it with SQL as well. But this is, this is one of the cool things you can do. Um, and I don't have time to talk too much about the other projects, but there, there are other things in the stack that are neat as well. So if you're interested in stream processing, um, Spark Streaming, which has actually uh, was, was released earlier this year, is our API to do that. And it lets you take all these functional operators you get in Spark and apply them on streams uh, in, along with new operators for windowing. Uh, so you can do fault tolerant uh, streaming computation. Um, and then if you're interested in machine learning, Something that's available on GitHub now is the beginning of, our, uh, of the ML-based project, which is this library called MLlib of high-quality implementations of machine learning algorithms. So this is a thing that's on GitHub, and it will be in the, in the uh, Spark 0.8 release, which will hopefully be uh, sometime in August. And it's basically, you know, it's, it's a team of, of machine learning researchers at Berkeley that are working on this. Okay. So in the last... Uh, part of the talk, I just want to talk about sort of where the project is heading and, and things we've seen. And I want to, to talk um, about both open source community and also this, you know, this idea of composition that, that I think is, is, is one of the coolest things about the project and that's where a lot of the research in Spark is going to be. So. Uh, let's start with the community. So we, we've been you know, uh, very um, uh, fortunate since we started the project to have a very rapidly growing community. And I just want to tell people a bit about it because I think if you, if you saw a Spark talk like you know, a year ago or two years ago, all these numbers would be many times smaller than they are today. Um, so just some quick stats on the community. Um, we have uh, over a thousand meetup members now in our San Francisco Bay Area meetup. I think again last year this might have been like 500. We have over 60 um, uh, external developers who have contributed to Spark over its lifetime. These are external to Berkeley. Within Berkeley we have maybe 10 to 15 uh, people that are working on it. And we have 17 companies that, are, that have contributed in the past year. And again, I think if I were giving this talk um, a year ago, this would have been maybe five or six. So it, it's, really, uh, you know, it's really been a blast in, in terms of uh, growing community. Um, this past year in particular has been very transitional. So um, it, it, I think a year ago, basically, uh, more than the majority of our developers were from inside Berkeley. Today, most of them are from, uh, are from outside. So we have, I think, 40 people who've contributed in the last year. Um, we have uh, many of the patches that have come in now, in, in, in addition to being sort of small fixes or improvements, we're actually getting large sort of multi-thousand line patches from outside, which were things that, you know, otherwise it would have taken us weeks or months to build ourselves. And also most code goes going into the project, if you count by lines of code, is now from outside UC Berkeley. And we're doing, you know, a lot of what, what I do, for example, is just code reviewing stuff and, and uh, testing it, making sure uh, it's something that we want in the project. 
So just some examples of things that were contributed uh, from outside in the past year. This is just a selection. There's been a lot more stuff, but these are some of the bigger sort of multi-thousand line patches. Um, uh, team at uh, Yahoo contributed all of our support for Apache Yarn. And so this is, I think, two or 3,000 lines of code. And it's not just adding hooks to launch Spark on Yarn, but it's also adding things like hack locality uh, awareness in the scheduler to make it run well on sort of multi-thousand node clusters. Uh, and so they they did a, quite a bit of refactoring of the scheduler to, to provide that. Um, a team at Intel um, in, in Asia um, has actually been rewriting our shuffle implementation. The shuffle is the network transfer between in, in sort of distributed reduce operations. And this is one of the most performance intensive things you get you have to do because a lot of applications are going to be network bound it's also it can be quite memory intensive so you have to be really careful with that it can do a lot of io operations as well and they've been working on improving this and you know they've given us a bunch of new patches that that make this quite a bit faster uh, another team at Intel uh, implemented a fair scheduler for jobs in the same instance of Spark. This is actually a thing I had implemented in Hadoop, so it's, it's kind of ironic that we never built it in Spark until someone else gave it to us from outside. Um, and the teams at Yahoo that are looking at uh, Shark are providing some pretty cool features there as well. So like one of them is, um, is compiling uh, SQL queries uh, into Java bytecode instead of just interpreting the SQL, which is what Hive does. Another thing is actually column-oriented uh, compression. Um, and then we've got an other stuff from the community that's more about integration and build, but that's also like pretty, you know, pretty time consuming to do ourselves. So for example, all of our support for Scala 2.10 has actually been contributed by this company called Imagina, which did some really non-trivial things like hacking the Scala interpreter in 2.10 to make it work with, uh, with, with Spark clusters, which is a thing we've had to do separately for each Scala release. And same thing with a lot of the packaging in the project that's been contributed. From, uh, from outside by companies like Clear Story Data. So we're, we're really excited to have these things, and I think as we've been ramping up, we're also getting better and better experience in terms of, of uh, you know, actually accepting these and, and testing them and so on. So we, we're going to continue doing that. And essentially, we, we are working closely with these contributors. We're happy to work with any new contributors as well. You know, we're getting more and more experience doing this. And uh, the other thing we're focusing on at, at the lab itself is making it easier to evaluate these kinds of changes. So you You'll see probably in the next few months uh, uh, sort of much more thorough performance test suites and regression uh, suites that are going to come out uh, to make it easy to evaluate changes to Spark. So if you want to contribute on this stuff, um, you, can, you can join us on GitHub. So let me, um, so let me end with, with one final thing, which is sort of where, where Spark is going and uh, things we've learned along the way. And I think the, the really cool thing is here is this, this um, aspect of composition. So basically, you know, you've seen all these slides about Spark. You might be saying sort of, well, it's, it's great that it's, it's fast, it's uh, easy to program because of the Scala API, but what really makes the project unique? You know, when, when there are so many, uh, uh, open source, you know, computing projects happening in the big data space. What what actually makes Spark unique? So the thing that we're doing uniquely and that I think is going to matter a lot is this idea of unification. So we uh, in Spark we don't just provide batch processing or just map reduce. We provide multiple programming models as diverse as SQL or streaming or graph processing on the same computing engine. And uh, so if you look at the stack, you know, we have these projects that are built on top of it. Many of these were uh, essentially separate uh, runtime systems in, in most other stacks. But here they run on the same engine and they can all share data uh, efficiently in memory through the Spark API. And this idea of unification has two powerful benefits. It has benefits for the engine itself, for actually building a good engine, and for the users. So from the engine perspective, uh, something we did recently that's kind of fun to do is let's look at Spark and compare it with the leading open source frameworks in these different types of analytics application, you know, streaming, SQL, all that stuff. And we'll compare them along two dimensions, code size and performance. So when you look at code size, uh, this is kind of what you get. 
Um, this is looking at, um, we have Hadoop map reduce on the left. You know, Hadoop is, is a big project. I only took the map reduce part, but it's still a pretty big thing. Um, we have um, Cloudera as Impala for SQL. Um, we have Storm for stream processing, um, and we have Giraffe for graph processing. And you know, these are each 60 to sort of 100,000 lines of code. Spark today is about 25,000. Now, some of this is because we're using Scala, so, and, you know, which is actually a good thing. You, you, we, at least if you're a Scala developer, uh, you can sort of appreciate that building these things in Scala makes them a lot easier to maintain. But it's still, you know, f from this point of view, um, it's actually it's, it's doing a lot with a small engine. Um, but then the part that's, that's really cool about this is if you add in, um, so these are four different engines, if you add in the components of our stack that do the other programming models. So if you add in, if you look at SQL, for example, uh, you know, Impala is this whole separate engine you have to run besides Hadoop MapReduce that's going to do fast SQL. Um, our SQL implementation, Shark, is about 12,000 lines of code just on top of the, the core engine. Um, if you look at stream processing, Storm is again this whole separate code base, does a lot of you know, special stuff for fault tolerance and scheduling. Our streaming implementation is about 7,000 lines. And if you look at graph processing, you've got this whole giraffe framework, and graphics itself is, is about 2,000 lines. So this is a really powerful thing, is that we, with a small, uh, you know, fairly small team of people at Berkeley, and uh, you know, growing, but, but still kind of uh, early on open source community, we're able to actually uh, capture all these models you know, in, in, in the same engine with quite a bit less, less repetition of work. Um, and then this is the code size. If you look at performance, in all these models, we're actually quite competitive. Um, so this is a benchmark we did uh, comparing SQL performance of Shark against Impala, as well as Amazon Redshift. And this is showing both um, on disk data and in memory data. Uh, with Redshift, unfortunately, you can't really control whether the data is on memory or on disk. It's basically going to cache it in memory after some time. And you know, this is just one of the queries. But in, in these cases, so we, we're competitive with Impala on disk, and we're actually faster than, than these things uh, in memory. So you know, we're, we're doing fine. I mean, all these projects are going to improve over time. But it's not like we're a factor of 10 behind or something. Um, this is comparing our uh, streaming performance. This is a throughput graph, so actually higher is better. And when we compared against Storm, this was you know, basically a, a while back, but uh, it was so sometime last year, uh, we were going about two times faster than Storm. So again, we're in the same ballpark. And this is the graph performance if you compare PageRank um, uh, with, uh, with Giraffe and Graphics, we're again at kind of a similar speed. So this stuff you know, it's, it's going to change over time, and it depends on the benchmark and so on. So you can definitely take it with a grain of salt. But what I'm trying to show here is that we actually have competitive performance in all these um, types of workloads using this much smaller and, and more integrated code base. Um, and the final thing that's cool about the, the performance aspect is that Whenever we do optimizations for one of these projects, we're actually helping all of them at once. So this has happened to us numerous times as we were developing the Spark stack. Just a recent example, when we put out Spark streaming, we did a bunch of optimizations to make the Spark scheduler work well for short sort of sub-second MapReduce jobs. Because in Spark streaming, we wanted to do many small jobs and incrementally add in new data. And then when we were writing a paper you know, on Shark after that to compare Shark's SQL performance, as soon as we switched to the branch that had these optimizations, all the short queries were going about two times faster. So this is a pretty cool thing that you know, you're not going to get uh, if you improve things like Storm and Impala independently. So this is kind of the performance perspective. Um, and from the user perspective, I've talked about this a bunch already, but hopefully you realize there are some, some pretty cool benefits as well. So one of them is that applications can easily compose these models. All these models have the same kind of Scala API and this abstraction of distributed collections. And so it's very easy to say run a SQL query, then run a graph algorithm on it, or run a machine learning algorithm on the result and just combine those in one program. Uh, the composition is not just doable, but it's efficient. 
So the data stays in memory across these steps. The fault tolerance works across them. You don't need to checkpoint the data or like save it to a weird data format in HDFS to load it back in into the next processing step. Um, so that's efficient. And also the models get this, this interactive shell that we built for the original project sort of for free. So if you want to analyze your, you know, your graph data interactively, ask some queries, you can just create that graph in the Spark shell. Uh, or actually a, a cool thing you can do in Spark streaming is if you want to interactively uh, explore the state of your stream, the state of it is just a bunch of RDDs and you can ask these queries on them exactly the same way you would for, you know, for, for some other in-memory table. And so this is, I think, it's a, it's a cool aspect that you know came out of the way we built the project, and it's also one of the things that will be our main long-term direction uh, in terms of research. Um, and there are a bunch of cool things you you can do with it. So. Uh, apart from just you know taking the existing models, one of the things we're looking at is what other programming models and types of computations we could build on top of the, the same engine. And we're looking at adding new primitives to the engine, like say incremental computation or mutable state that will let you express more types of computations efficiently. Um, so, so that's one of the things. The other thing uh, we, you know, we, we want to look at is uh, optimizing better across these different programming models. So for example, in Scala 2.10, when you have macros, you can start peeking into the functions people are giving you, and you can do stuff like push down predicates. If, if you're going to do a SQL query and then a Scala function on the result, uh, you can push down some filters from Scala into SQL and start optimizing across all of these. And so we think that you know, in the long term, if you look at big data analytics, many projects today are just focusing on getting it done. Like, how do I even do machine learning or a graph computation? But as soon as people have tools for that, to really be productive, they'll need to be able to combine them. And this is one of the things that you know, we, we want to support here. So that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, so maybe one, one more important thing, which is how do you get started if, if you want to, uh, to play with Spark? Uh, we, we have quite a few resources online for getting started, and you should just go to sparkproject.org to check them out. Some of the cool things available are a video tutorials, screencasts that will let you set it up and use it, uh, as well as hands-on exercises. We have a set of exercises on EC2 where you launch this little four-node cluster. It comes populated with some data, and you can use all these projects to, to step through to analyze this data. And it's easy to run Spark either locally on your laptop uh, or on different types of standalone clusters, including uh, Apache, Mesos, and Yarn, or on EC2. You can launch uh, a cluster that we, we configure for you. And then if you want to learn more about it in person, we have a training camp coming up at the end of August in Berkeley. This is a two-day event where you can use Spark. You can do both hands-on exercises and just uh, see sort of tutorials with us doing them. Um, and you can do it in person. So I invite you to check that out. So to conclude, big data analytics is going to evolve. It's going to con combine more complex analytics, more interactive, and more real time. And in the Spark project, we're building a platform that unifies these. It's open source, and we invite you to try it out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. With Delight, yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah, we, we've actually talked with um, the Delight group at Stanford quite a bit, and they have a few projects where, well, they've been taking similar types of computations and trying to map them to run on top of GPUs and things like that. So I actually want to collaborate uh, more with them to try to actually run some of these on top of Spark. Yeah, I've talked with them a bunch of times. Yep, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, some of them are. You, know, you should send me a, an email. So I think they're, they're published in separate papers, but if you want them all together, you, you, I can probably try to get you the source for each one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the benchmark. So at least the the SQL benchmark. It, it's actually a, a a thing you can run yourself. We have a page about it, and we have Amazon machine images you can run it on. So all all of that is designed so you can launch it yourself. And we want to do the same with the other ones. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say you use a sorry. Uh, uh huh. Yes. Yes. 
Uh, oh, let's say you lose a node. Yeah. So yeah. So when a node gets lost, essentially um, we lose some some partitions of an RDD, and we reconstruct just those missing partitions. And actually, one of the the nice things that happens there is like usually a node has uh, not just one partition, but maybe like 20 or 100. So we actually spread those out across the rest of the cluster and recompute them in parallel. Yeah. It's similar to like when a node uh, fails in map reduce and you lose like the map function output. Yeah. So we, we do partial recompute. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So one way to view uh, Firefox process is that it provides a sort of orthogonal set of abstractions on top of which you can build all these things. Yeah, yeah. Was that the goal from the beginning? Or yeah. <laughs> No, so that's a really good question. So it it um, it really wasn't. I mean, it's a thing that it, it, this is just me being honest. Like otherwise, I would have said, "Oh yeah, we we knew we had a more general thing." But but uh, it really um, it, it's a thing we discovered as we went along. So when we started Spark, we we were only really focusing on machine learning computations, and then new things like Peggle came out, and we looked at them, and we were thinking like, "Oh no, could those also do this stuff well?" And then we realized we could uh, we could implement them. So basically, at, at some point after that, we switched to a mode where we were more actively seeking out other things we can do. Um, and, and, and also seeking out abstractions, like common abstractions we can add, like say, control over the data partitioning that would help improve a bunch of these together. Um, so yeah, so it, it didn't start that way, but it's um, in a sense also because of necessity, if, if we wanted to do a graph thing or a SQL thing, the first thing we did was try to do it on Spark, and then if that worked, we didn't have to build a new engine for it. So, so that's kind of how it came out. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in your example, you like don't cache from RDDs or don't cache Yes, RDDs. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So now it, it doesn't automatically try to figure this out. Uh, this is a thing we might add in the future. It's, uh, well, I think doing it well is, is pretty hard, but, um, but that also makes it interesting, at least from a research point of view. Uh, probably the first place where you might see that is in Shark, where it might decide based on how often you access tables and stuff, it might automatically decide how to cache them. But we don't have that yet. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no. So cache and validation, you also have to do yourself. We don't try to propagate updates to the graph. That would, again, be a cool thing to do. But this is just to keep it simple for now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, when is the transition to 2.10? Yeah, good question. So we, so I think the, the Spark 0.8 release, which is going to be uh, you know, soon, hopefully in the next month, that will still be using 2.9. And after that, we're going to switch to 2.10. So the reason why we pushed it a little bit is just because there's a lot of new stuff that came in into 0.8, like a lot of these you know, changing the shuffle and stuff like that, or, or the scheduler. And we don't want to make too many big changes at once. Uh, but there is a Scala 2.10 branch that's you know pretty close to being in sync with with the master branch, so you can use that. Um, and we you know we hope to like when we release point eight, we're also going to update that branch to have you know kind of a Scala 2.10 version of Spark uh, 0 0.8. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any more questions? Or? All right. So I think thanks for coming, and it's time for lunch, I guess. <laughs>